Welcome back to Hot Takes and Deep Dives. And I am here with the showrunner of the L Word Generation Q. Hi, Marsha Lewis Ryan. Hi, Jess. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. good. I'm good. Are you in LA right now? I sure am. I'm Dang. in my uh, best friend's apartment. We are uh, working on a feature together, and it is so fun. Oh, that's great. Is your best friend li- like a no, like somebody that we would know, like a writer? We She's a know? writer on the L Word. So in that way, you might know her. What's her name? Her name is Ali Romano. She and I, yeah. she was my, um, she, yes, I've been around a long time now, but she, so she started off as my manager's assistant and then she became my assistant for a long time. And the L word season one was her first staffing job. So, um, we've sort of like come up together and now we're co-writing, um, a reboot to girls just want to have fun. Pretty fun. No kidding. Oh my God. Like the Helen Hunt movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I was obsessed with Helen yeah. Hunt, like from the Mad About You days. Um, Me too. But this isn't. Me too. This isn't a Mad About You podcast. <laughs> it could be though. Well, it could be. We could talk about that the episode where they're locked in the bathroom. That's like one of the greatest episodes of television. That of all Valentine's time. Day episode is one of the. They don't make television like that anymore. No. I mean, they tried with Bet and Tina locked in the elevator, but you know. I was going to say, actually, they tried to make Mad About You again, and they couldn't even do that. So I watched the reboot of Mad About You, actually. Lightning in a bottle. Yeah. Now, my favorite fun fact about you is that you wrote and directed a film starring Abby Jacobson called Six Balloons, and it was during a Vanity Fair interview for that film, promoting that film, you're already laughing, you know what I'm going to say, that she inadvertently came out to the interviewer, kicking off this entire second wave of her career. Of course, it's like the L Word showrunners like movie that this happened. Like That's funny that you know that. I don't know if most people think about that moment like and connects those moments but first of all I think that I think that Abby is so smart and so funny and and she is I just admire her so much you know like um I feel really like thankful I count my lucky stars that she's somebody that I can like call on and I would like to think she thinks of me the same way like we're, we're people who like share a lot of drafts of things Um, Like I got to read her book uh, before it came out. And um, that movie in particular was very gay um, because my producing partner is a giant homosexual and it was her story. So it was like the two of us were sort of like at the helm. And so it was just a very gay film set. What was the backstory for how you landed the Gen Q gig? One of the things like I really, I really feel so strongly about is like demystifying this job and like demystifying the career I am not some, I, I'm not that special, you know, I think, I think that that's, it's really important for queers to know that like they, they can just do this. So the, the way that I came up was I, I started off as an actor. I went to NYU. I thought that that was like my path. And then when I came out here, the one thing I really learned at school was to make my own work. So when I moved out here with my three best friends, I made a gay movie um, that was really about my life. And the reason why I made that was because when I was 18, I saw the L word and I realized I could just tell my own stories that really gave me permission. So Eileen sort of like shown this light, like, and I was like determined to follow it. And um, so I made a gay movie and then like, I made a bunch of plays. What was that that, movie called? It's called The Four-Faced Liar. I star in it too. It's so super cute. Um, It's about um, my college girlfriend who is now my wife. So it's like a very near and dear project to me. It's not good necessarily, but I'm, I was still just getting good. You know, I'm just practicing. Um, so that was like my big sort of swing. I was like 24 when that movie came out. And then over the next like six years, I spent my, a lot of time in a tiny black box theater on Santa Monica Boulevard, just making shit. And, um, because I was a kind of person that could make things from end to end, it made sense to me that like I could run my own TV show. I knew how to write, direct, produce, and edit. I knew how to do everything. I knew how to deliver a product. So that sort of positioned me in this like very particular space of creatives that like might actually get a job like that. Um, My very first studio job, which I also got from a queer executive, keep them close, you know, keep your friends close. Um, That queer executive got me my first studio job and we were doing a a studio adaptation of the Sheryl Sandberg self-help book, Lean In. Okay. Okay. It was a terrible idea. But we, they basically hired like seven or eight women to like come in and write these like little vignettes of like women in the workspace. And I was like, obviously I'm here to write the gay story. And then Eileen Shaken walked in and I was like, two gay stories. 
And uh, that's how I met her is that like we were in this writer's room, this like two week writer's room for this very, you know, <laughs> strange project that never went forward. Um, and but so I was she was literally just a writer on that project? Yep. It was like me, her, Tracy Oliver. It was just like I was I was the I was the the strangest part of it. Like everyone else had careers, but I was brand new. And I felt like as like the youngest and like least experienced person in the room, I thought it was my job to just pitch. I was like, I just have to do all the work like that. I, I just know I have to do all the work. And I think in doing that, I really made an impression on her. Um, and I got to go up to her and just say thank you for making that show. And like, thank you for making me feel seen and thanking, thanked her for making it possible for me to be here. Um, and then about six months later, I saw her name in the credits for The Handmaid's Tale. And I sent her an email that just said, congratulations on The Handmaid's Tale. It's brilliant. And you're a genius. And that's all I said. And I really want young writers to hear that. But that's all I said. I asked for nothing. All I said was congratulations on The Handmaid's Tale. I was secretly hoping that she was going to be like, do you want to come shadow? Because I was like, you know, in between like directing and writing. And she, instead, she said, I was just thinking of you. Do you want to come pitch on the L word? And I said, yeah. Had it been announced yet that they were no. rebooting it? Oh, wow. Okay. No. So I, I didn't know anything. I just knew like, that was her email back to me, truly. And I was like, called my my manager. And I was like, I, I don't know if this is real. I don't know like what this is. But like, uh, yes, obviously, yes. So I put together a pitch, I got to meet Jennifer, Kate and Alicia, like in a in an Indian restaurant on Sunset Boulevard. I mean, it was bizarre. I, I was like just sweating for like six months and um, just trying to put together this pitch. I went in and pitched and I got the job. That was about five years ago. What was that initial pitch? Basically, the pitch was I wanted to maintain the friendships on the original show because that's what I thought worked. And I wanted to widen the scope of people who are able to see themselves on television inside of this space. That was really it. It was just like, how do I maintain and then widen? But that, that was it. That was all I really wanted to do at the jump. That's all I wanted to do at the jump. As, as the show has gone on, I've gotten to do so much more than that. But um, those were like the two important things to me. And that was really the simplicity of the pitch was like, I, I, I'm just going to write about my own experience as a lesbian in Los Angeles. I had lived here for like 11 years at that point. And I do remember that at some point in my, in my pitch, I said like 11 years or 11 seasons. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was yeah. sort of my, my, my big hook. Um, and when did yeah. the when did the characters get developed? Like, did you go in? Like, did the characters come out of just like the writers brainstorming in the writers' room, or did you come to the table with, okay, I have an idea for all pitches always have all characters. So you in that initial pitch, you like you were talking about like a Finley type character, a Sophie. No, type not a Finley type character. I'm saying Sarah Finley. She's 28. She's blah blah. I know exactly who they are. Every single character is completely developed before you walk in the room. Oh, so you were very specific. It wasn't as high level as you're kind of. You can't sell anything without knowing exactly who your characters are, what defines them, what they want, what they need, how they change over time. Those things are, that's how you sell a television show. When you found out that you had got the job, like what was your reaction? <sighs> I wept. I wept openly. I, I had just moved. I, I had just moved back to New York. I had just gotten married. Um, we had like literally just unpacked our final box and I got the call and I just remember like sobbing on the kitchen floor and I was like, oh my God, we're not going to have a baby in New York. I mean, there's just no, and like my whole sort of like personal life was like, oh, that's, and I had to like get back in the car and drive back across the country. And then I didn't know what I was doing in the beginning for sure. And I, I stumbled for the first like six months just trying to get the pilot into a place that like felt like a show could continue beyond that. Um, but once I got that, they greenlit the series. So I didn't have to like shoot a pilot and then shoot the series. They, they greenlit the first eight episodes off of the first episode that I'd written. And had you come with ideas for Bet, Alice and Shane or did you like, did they come with, okay, this is where we see these characters. Like how much of that was your influence? It was both. It was definitely both things. Like, like I remember coming into the series and like, I really wanted there to be like, um, 
So something something that I that I did think doesn't work just like as a just as a writer, not as a viewer, but as a writer, the show itself just doesn't have a concept. Like lesbians in Los Angeles is not is not a concept that, that that's just a group of people in a space. It's missing like a third element. And so I had always hoped that like Bet's mayoral campaign could sort of serve as the spine of the show because because it does sort of need an engine. And so that that I came with. And it also felt like something like a way to like get deeper into Los Angeles, because the way that I diversified the cast was just really observing Los Angeles. I was like, who's here that's not on screen? And to me, that was like Latinx folks, Asian folks and Persian folks. Those are kind of like the three broad swaths of like people that I'm I just you can't throw a rock. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, they're everywhere. So. I just wanted those people on the show. And then everyone else that sort of came was like, just came from casting and character development afterward. Did that answer the question? Yeah, well, I was asking more, more like with like Shane's story and Alice's story. Like, I know that like it was Leisha's idea, like, oh, Alice should have a talk show. I mean, Jennifer Beals has said that yeah. like she thought, oh, Bet would be running for mayor. Like how much of that was them? Yes, I think I think that they did all sort of come to me with like, with like, here's what I really don't want here's what I would love. And like, and like, here's what like the character means to me. I mean, that that meeting in the in the Indian restaurant on Sunset Boulevard, truly, like, I was sitting at a table, just like, just taking in all the information that they were willing to give me about like their characters and their arcs in the original series and stuff they loved. Like, I was also always always asking them, like, what did you love? Like, what did you love? Because I kept finding that those were things we agreed on. You know, like what they loved, we loved as as an audience. Like th- there's like a one to one correlation. Yeah, I just tried to I, I tried to lean into all of that, but also try to give the show some um, structure inside of all of them. Like like the fact that like a, a tertiary character owned the planet is like not quite right. You know, like you actually need it to be shame. Like you actually need it to be like someone inside of your fold that like in order to force people there. Because that's the other way that you get some structure is like that they're all in the same place. Otherwise, they all have to be doctors in a hospital, which I've also threatened. Right. right. Now, I know that the writers on the show are quite young. Like they're, I think, maybe even like two generations below me. Like I'm 40. So like I watched the original pilot, like the night it aired. Like I've seen every episode, like when it originally aired. Have the writers, have they all seen the original series? I don't know. But I, but I would push back on that the writers are young. I think that um, our, we have the most diverse room in Hollywood. And I think it go, like our age range is like 25 to 65. So I, I wouldn't say that, that that's right. Oh, wow. I didn't realize mm-hmm. to, to 65. Okay. And what have been like your biggest challenges in making the show? <laughs> Aside from the fact that you had never done it before. That's it. That's the hardest part is that you don't know. I mean, like, I mean, you know, it's like any experiment, right? There's like a set of, there's a set of knowns, there's a set of like known unknowns, and then you're into the unknown unknowns. I had just all unknowns. I mean, there were so much that I didn't know coming into the job and that I like had to and also got to like learn on the fly. That's really all, that's the only reason, that's how I learn, you know? Like I don't think I could have learned it any other way. I'm not a person that like um, follows direction well. I mean, both literally and just figuratively. I, I don't think I could have come up in someone else's room. I like really needed to like throw spaghetti and pick it up myself. I got to fail and succeed on my own terms. And that's how I came up. You know, like I came up in like sitting in black box theaters, like watching people watch my stuff. And like I have a really strong internal barometer for like what I think is going well and what is not going well. I mean, on that note, can you talk about that? Like, what do you think is going well and what do you think isn't going well? I think that the thing that the show, the thing about this show is that it's so much more than the show. It's so much more than like the actual narrative experience of the show running this show has also given me the opportunity to basically establish a pipeline of queer artists and women of all stripes. And I've just been like pumping out talent in all departments for the last three years. And I've like really made a dent. Um, Like there are some, there's just so many people that are coming off of this show that haven't had the breaks, you know, like haven't quite had the break for some reason. And then coming out of here, they've had them. 
And what about the flip Um, side? I think that every year that I get to have this job, I gain perspective as a writer. So because I have this like acting background, my all of my writing comes from like the ground. So I am like standing in these character shoes, very literally. Like when I'm breaking story, I am like walking around Finley's apartment. I am like, I am like, I like inhabit them um, as an actor would. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like very interior. Um, That's how all of my work begins is like me as character. I think that's my greatest strength. And then my greatest weakness is from up here is like all the way back. So um, like some writers can come in from this world building space and then they can't they can't land in shoes i i i have a hard time getting up so so uh, every year i've gotten like a little bit more perspective and and by that i mean like i can tell i could write an episode of this show right now in 60 minutes or less i could just i could just give you an episode because i know exactly the form there is a there is a structure there's a format there's a formula and i know what it is and that is incredible. Like I did not come in with that set of knowledge. I didn't know that the show had a formula that, that I could, that I could crack. I didn't even know that there was a formula to crack, (laughs) you know, like I, I, that's how, that's how in shoes I was like starting. And now I have some distance and I can really understand how an episode functions. I think that what another season would give me is like, one more click into how a season functions in three acts like a season long arc it's not quite that simple but yes yeah (laughs) i mean is the broader goal to phase out the ogs and have the younger crew be the centerpiece no Mm -mm. i mean no that's not the goal with the showtime paramount merger like where do you see the show going i don't know I think that like one of the best things about me is that I operate in reality always. I always operate in literally what's in front of me. I don't get tripped up in the past and I don't get tripped up in the future. Um, I know that episode nine airs tomorrow night and it is um, Rosie's last episode of the season. And I'm just so proud of it. It's so good. She's the best and she gets, she's working opposite, um, like one of my other best friends, Heidi Solzman, who's playing Misty. And and that relationship was like one of the greatest things that I, I feel like I was able to do this season. I'm just like so, so proud of it. it it's the relationship that I wish I'd been able to see when I was 16. Mm-hmm. I want to talk uh, very quickly or as much time as you have about Bet and Tina. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so here's here's my specific question about Bet and Tina. The callbacks to the Bet and Tina stuff, I mean, I think you know what I'm referring to. Do those come from the actors who remember those scenes so well? Or did you go back and rewatch those more like pivotal, crucial scenes that were so defining for them? We, we are like scrubbing through. We're like, okay, it's that, it's that. Or sometimes the director too. Because I, I think some of the moments you're talking about, like Catrell Kindred's like a real student. And I think she she brought a lot um, of her own um, stuff. I'm trying to think of who else sort of had those moments. Logan Gibbons, I remember, directed episode six of season one. And she she had a bunch of um, like her, own, like, you know, she's like, yeah, I mean, she was just like, these are my people. Like, this is, I will live and die by this couple. Um, so, she, you know, so I think it, it's a combination of things, actors, directors, writers. And on Jennifer Beals, like how much does she bring to the character of Bet? Like how involved is she? So all three of them, like the, the, the like EP sort of like process that we have is that they get scripts before anybody else. So I, I write the scripts, and I send it to them. And then they give me notes on their stuff. And then I take their notes before I send it to like the network. So, so, Lisha, so, we, we, so Lisha Kate and yeah, Jennifer. Bills. Okay. Jennifer. Yeah. And so, and, and so we, we work like that. Like we work like pretty closely in the beginning. Like I would have them come into my office and like read scenes to be like, is this it? Am I doing it? Is this right? Does this feel right? But yeah, I mean, like she'll send me emails and be like, I, I, I wish that you had already seen the finale. Cause I feel like I might be able to answer this question even better. But there are some times that said, there are some times where I'm like, can you write it? Or can you give me like a rough draft or like, can you tell me like what's essential to this moment, you know? 
Um, like, like when she was chasing her down, like in the car, like, like we would talk, we talk about that in like very, like, like line by line. We're going line by line together. Is there anything that she literally wrote? Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, I think, I think that there's like lots of lines inside of that speech that she literally wrote. I think there's like a lot of stuff in episode 10. I feel like once I say this to you, you'll be like, oh, I know what she wrote. Just like, she knows the character more than I will. How could, how, how could that not be true? You know? Um, and I think there's just like a, you know, mutual respect for the three of them coming in as experts. I want to go a little bit deeper on Bet. The thing about Bet's mom, how we still, as of today, listen, I don't know what's happening in the next two episodes, obviously, <laughs> but my greatest wish is that I, I, I don't know that we can sign off on Bet Porter unless we meet the mom, who is clearly the reason for all of this behavior. That is, you know, and we've met all of the new characters, you know, so many of the new characters, parents, Finley, like Sophie's whole family, you know, years with Danny's father. What is the conversation around the closure around Beth's mom? Um, I think that that was actually something Jennifer and I like really worked closely on um, in uh, just talking about like what really, like how do people really transform in a lifetime? And like really, truly the only way to transform, I think, is to like, forgive your parents, you know? And I, so I, I, it's something that I have personally gone through and I, I have like a similar backstory to bet in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that was like really meaningful, uh, I think for both of us to be able to just even mention, mention that that is part of her life, like outside of the show. Um, I don't know, like if I got a season four, and like you want to do like a like a bet centric episode where like she's like with like her mom. She like like there's something interesting about that, I guess. There's also just like something about the mystery that I, I think like works for the character because she is like so unknowable in some ways. She's like hard to hold. Did you guys ever kick around fantasy casting like who each either Jennifer or you like who in the galaxy of actresses, would you even see as Beth's mom? No, because she would have to be like 90 years old. And so, and that was actually where we stopped talking about it. We were like, is it Maggie Smith? Like, I mean, like, it's just, it's just like not, it's like really hard to imagine like what 90 year old white woman it would be. Um, but we, we did talk about Maggie Smith. Uh, no, but no. I would love to go through like specific storylines and like kind of flesh out where you were coming from, like the thinking behind them, like how we landed here. If that's cool, this is all we can stuff. Try. But yeah, this is all stuff that's already aired. Just want to know like how we got to certain places. So Angie was actually, I would say like Angie is in my top two favorite new characters, like of like the younger generation. Thinks people that we well, I guess we technically did have her in the original actually as a as an infant. Um, but she, I I really feel that she was one of the best written characters in the first two seasons of the show. How did you land on the idea for her to date her instructor? Um, I think that Jordan Hull is like so good. I mean, like, so good. When she first showed up, I remember watching her tape on my cell phone. And she was 15 years old. And I was, like, going through these tapes. And I'm like, it's such a hard thing to cast, right? Because, like, yeah, she was in the original, technically. And, like, we do actually oddly have a visual. I mean, I do anyway. Like, I, I remember what that kid looked like. Completely. You know? So I so like there were some kids that came in and I was like, well, she's good, but like, she, unfortunately, she doesn't look like that girl grown up. Like she just doesn't. Like I, I, it was just, it was just, you know, I was like, are we ever gonna find this person? What a strange thing to have to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I, I just remember like seeing their tape and I like ran into my assistant's office and I was like, oh my god, like they're a person. They're like a real person and like they're gonna, they're here. So they were young, they were really young. And, and their original sort of role was like very much the daughter of, you know, they weren't a series regular on the show, they sort of functioned as part of a unit, rather than like having their own sort of individual story. We were able to like elevate them a little bit, like with the love story with Jordy, which was like always really fun. I that was fun to write. But because of COVID, and um, because of like, just 
having the show on the air the way that it is, the way that it airs, they've grown up. And I wanted to tell a story that reflected like their 19 year old self. And this story came out of the writer's room. Is there any reason that like, what was the choice to make it a male instructor versus a woman? I think it's important that people get to explore their sexuality. And I'm always looking for ways to show that rather than talk about it. There's a lot of time like spent on characters and couples who aren't like the, like not re- lesbian relationships like Angie and the instructor, um, Alice uh, dating men, Mike and Maribel. Like, do you see this as still like a lesbian centric show or like Is that part of the broader, like you talked about in your initial pitch, you wanted to broaden the lens? Yes, I I think both. I think it will always be a white lesbian show because I am a white lesbian. But I think that we've successfully, you know, included people by adding them to the writer's room and then they show up on screen. Were you a huge fan of Dana in the original? Is that the reason that Dana is so present in the reboot? I think that, I think that actually, though, season one, I, I, I have I have some memory of I, I don't think I'm alone. I think that most of the writers that have come on the show are like big Dana fans. Mm-hmm. Um, I also think that, like, that was one of the strongest choices that Eileen made, like killing killing a beloved character. Season three is like such a bold and like in my opinion correct move for a show like this and I I never so I never wanted to undermine that you know I never wanted to I always wanted to honor the fact that I thought that was the right decision but I've always wanted to have Aaron Daniels back also and I just remember season one for a long time we had on our on our whiteboard there was just like a sign that said Dana is dead And the reason why it said that was because so many people would try to pitch ways that Dana was coming back. And I was like, no, she can't, she can't just come back. I was like, she's dead. We have to, we have to honor the truth is that she's dead. But then inside of that, like, how do we make her come back? You know? Right. Right. I mean, I'm like, they'd already done the ghost. So we were like, no ghosts, you know? I mean, I'm into a ghost. Um, Kate Menig had said a few weeks ago um, that she went. So I thought it was great how you had Daniel C. come back. That was absolutely the right choice. Kate Menig had said a few weeks ago that she really wanted Shane and Max to bring up Jenny because that's the one thing they had common. The one thing they had in common because they live together. Yeah. What is the deal with Jenny? With in, in context of this show, like it seems like the, there, like there's obviously um, no fear around referencing Dana, but we've really only gotten the one reference to Jenny in one of those early episodes, kind of confirming her suicide. What is your feeling on the Jenny of it all? Um, I guess I think about her in terms of like how it feels to to have lost a friend tragically um, a decade ago. And it just doesn't feel like there's a lot of opportunity in the stories that we create to talk about it. Kate and I really did try to get to get Max and her to talk about her, but it was so fucking weird. You know, it was just like every time we tried, it was like bizarre because they only had that one scene. It's like a, it's like an eight line exchange. Mm-hmm. It was just bizarre. And, and we, we tried. We really did. There's very there's various versions of drafts where we were like trying to do like man, how long has it been? 13 years? Like, is that how long she's been gone? Like we were trying to like, we tried to do like things like that. And it just, it just sucked. So um, I haven't been able to figure out that piece yet, but I'm not invested in it. I, I am invested in the future of my characters and not the past. All right. We have to talk about, <sighs> listen, the name on everybody's lips is Gigi and Seppi <laughs> okay. okay. Now fans were so attached to the slow and romantic build between Gigi and Danny. And obviously we start the season and they're already over. I get that you have to make certain story decisions because of external factors. What can you say about Sepita leaving after the first three episodes? Well, I mean, to me, it's like, it's, well, first of all, I think she's a, a really brilliant actor and I was so happy to have her from the jump. I think that having the two of them on and like 
speaking Farsi together in that season two was like, again, on my deathbed, I'm pumped about that. You know, I'm really pumped about that moment. I'm pumped about their relationship. I mean, the, and the, the reason why that really happened was because season one, Gigi's entrance into the world, she comes in. Do you remember this? Of course. She comes in and she tells the kids to get their backpacks. Yes. But she tells them in Farsi. Yes. I saw that episode in a bar in Los Angeles. And like I told you, like I, I did that on purpose. I did that because I knew that there were Persians in LA. Like I, I, I'm paying attention to the world around me. But I was not prepared for a room full of Persian lesbians. I mean, all this woman said was get your backpacks, okay? And they lost it. I mean, the whole, they were like, ah, it's us, we're there. It was like crazy. And I was like, oh, they they need this. I was like, people need this. We, we need to lean in here. Like we have something that people have never seen before and we, we need to lean in. I just think that like the reason why people connected to it is because it was real. They're not like actors putting on accents. They're not actors learning languages. Those are real actors who really speak Farsi who, and I don't, and I'm, I'm just writing, you know, I write in Farsi, in Farsi, in Farsi. And then they take the script and they're like, would you say it like this? No, that's the formal one. I would go like this. And like, so all of that, like, that's what you're feeling. You're feeling how real it is. But the other part of this job, like I said earlier, was like creating this pipeline of people that I'm like pumping into the world. Like we made Sephidamofi, like you made Sephidamofi, you did it. Like we did it. And like, now she has like huge opportunities. And like, it is my job, I really believe to support her through those opportunities because that's how we grow. That's how we get bigger is that our stars rise. Mm -hmm. You know, like when when you have sh people on your television show that are rising, like, I, I want that. We should need that. We want that. Because it's not just a show. It's also a community project, you know, and like, that's us. She's one of us. And she's out there. It's the opposite of the experience that a lot of the cast members had in the original series. I don't know if you've like ever spoken to them, but like they they had a hard time working after that show that it was not the same. So, so I'm trying to redefine what it means to play gay, be gay, you know, all of those things. And like, this is meant to be a launching pad for people's careers. This is not a place to die. This is a place to begin. I mean, are we supposed to infer that she, that the character is just back with Nat now? I, I don't think you need to infer it. I think you need to watch the rest of the season. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, now, before actually Gigi was paired with Danny, a lot of fans, including myself, was really excited that she and Bet were going to like date. Um, that definitely felt like a very well matched pair, a very interesting pair to watch. Uh, Here's my question: Why? Yeah. Why was the the writing around Bet in relation to Gigi? Like Bet was so dismissive of this character and it seemed out of character for bet like as we've known her she was never dismissive of people or dismissive of people she was dating like what what was what was the issue with bet and Gigi and just bet's behavior toward Gigi I honest to god cannot remember <laughs> I'm so sorry but that was like four years ago I have no idea what I wrote four years ago I don't know I, I, think I mean, she was basically like, like know, an asshole to this character that we all loved. Part of the show is um, like, you know, pairing people together and pulling them apart. I mean, because because they aren't doctors in a hospital, that is sort of the that is our structure. And so, you know, I, I'm always trying to find ways to bring people together, like unexpected people together and have unexpected results. I want to talk about Joey Lauren Adams. Um, obviously, <laughs> obviously, like, I'm a, you know, listen, I grew up on Chasing Amy, like, obviously. Me too. What was the situation there? Like, could she just not commit to more episodes? Because, like, it felt like it was over before it began with her and Alice. Alice. It's just Alice. It's Alice's fundamental flaw. What is her fundamental flaw? What do you think her fundamental flaw is? Mm, maybe she writes people off too quickly. Mm hmm. <laughs> right. So how do you learn that lesson? By, I, I know, but like, I just wish that we had like gotten to see more of it. I'm, I'm just talking as an audience. <laughs> Classic. Yeah. I am driving this bus. 
I promise you I'm driving it. Even if you're like, what the fuck this bus is veering? I'm driving it, baby. I'm driving it. She knows what she's doing. She's driving the bus. You're in the back and we're all on the ride. It's so fun. Wait till you fucking see the next two episodes. I want to be standing next to you when they air. Oh, I wish that's what I want. That's going to be the gift you can give me is that I want a camera on your face for nine and ten. And you can be talking to me directly and then shoot it to me. Send me an email. We can exchange in, we can exchange information. <laughs> yes, let's do this. I love this show so much. Like I grew up on this show. Like I'm not like I if I could crawl inside it, I would. Like I'm like like you got to understand me. <laughs> like <laughs> that's really why I wanted to bring the show back is because nothing in my life and I'm sure nothing in yours has ever been like this. There's no other show that like has a line of lesbians down the fucking block in all the cities around this country every single weekend. Like it is so fun. And like, I don't mind that people hate me and I don't mind that people think I've ruined their lives because I know that they're watching. And like, I know that like the reason why they're pissed that Gigi's gone is because they loved her. Yeah, exactly. of course. Of course. Yeah, and like, I think, and people, like that, are just, I think people are just looking for answers. Like they're just looking for more information. You know, whether or not we go on again is is still very much up in the air. I don't have any secret information that I'm holding back from you. I, I really genuinely don't know. But I do know that like this was successful in 2022 to have three seasons of a television show is like we're winners. I want to talk about the trans representation on the show. I've loved Jamie Clayton forever. Like I was a huge fan of what Sense. What a dream, right? I'm a huge I was a huge fan of Sense 8. Was it her decision to play like was she offered the opportunity like okay, if you want you could you, we can make your character trans if you don't want that. Like we can go either way with it. Yeah, so in, in the audition, I said to her, I said, what's next for trans? I said, like, this show is meant to be, like, on the cutting edge. Like, what's next for trans representation? Like, what's not happening that we should be doing that, that you're not seeing? And she's like, just let me play the part. What she liked about the breakdown was that it didn't say anything. And so I, and I then continued that throughout the entire season, like, series, where, like, all of my roles are open to what anybody who wants to play them, basically. And I've like really tried very early on. I was like, oh, I know how I can help my people is I can hire them and get them health insurance because SAG after health insurance is banging. And so basically all of the roles that are like under five lines are played by trans and non-binary people. And that is like very much by design so they can have health insurance. <laughs> that, that's amazing. Wow. I mean, like we're not just a show. We're like a community center. You know what I mean? Like we really are. Two actors this season, um, I, I, forgive me, I don't remember the characters' okay. names. The guy, the, the Gen Zer who, um, it, it, Chris, Chris, Ren, Renfro. Chris Renfro. Chris Renfro. Yeah, Renfro. I don't remember his character. So Chris Renfro and, oh my God, I think the actor's name is Army something. It's the character Army. who played Max's partner. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, but I immediately recognized both of these actors because I was a huge fan of the Queers Folk reboot, which was on Peacock. Did you watch that show, by the way? Well, I haven't actually seen it yet, but when I when I got these two people in, I was like, wow, that show must be so good because they, they are outstanding. I, I wish I could show you like the outtakes from that scene where like they're they're sleeping with Alice because I, I, I mean, we were dying. They're so funny. They're so, so funny. So charming. So I bring up the Queers Folk reboot because it actually centers the lead of that show is a trans woman this fantastic actress jesse james Keitel, and the mm -hmm. center of that show is her relationship with her non-binary partner when i was watching that show because it that's the centerpiece and it was played to great success it made me think what it would have been like had tess been trans and we see shane oh my God, I'm in love with a trans woman. What does that mean? Like here you have a uh, historically yeah, the was, androgynous that character. That was exactly why I didn't want to do it. Wh what do you mean? Because I, I don't want to tell those stories. 
what do you, which so which stories because because i don't know how like like i don't i don't get that conflict because i'm too queer to get that conflict that's like not a conflict enough for me i can't stand in those shoes like if shane had never been with a trans person and now dating a trans person just just the idea that she would struggle in some way where do you want shane to go <laughs> um <laughs> Just have to watch the next two episodes. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I want her. I want her to. I want her to be able to figure out like what were the best parts of her, and like really hold on to the best parts of her while also like moving ahead. I don't think she's been able to figure out how to reconcile her past and her present. And I think that once she can do that, I think the sky is sort of the limit. I I, I love working with Kate Menning. You know, she directed this next episode. Yes. And Leisha directed the finale, and like it was just. I mean, working with them, they're icons. Those are queer icons. They, they're the first queer people that ever played queer people on television, as far as I know. And and it was so cool to be able to, like, just sort of nod to them in, like, the most respectful way possible by, like, making them the leaders of the ship. So a friend of mine runs a lot of, like, uh, events in New York City, like, queer events. And so she's, like, out in the, in the streets, like, talking to people all the time. She has told me how she's like, you know, there are a lot of people who they're just watching Gen Q. Like, they didn't even know there was an original show. And they, like, don't even care to watch the original and they're just and they just like gen q and like i think because i lived the whole thing i'm like that's sure. shock that would be like i mean i don't know i can't really think of an yeah, instance it would, yeah it would be like it would be like not seeing the first star wars well, and no, it would like, be like oh, you know oh i love happening? and just like that but i i don't give a shit about knowing what sex in this like what <laughs> yeah and you're like what i mean to me that's yeah, insane totally. Um, and yeah. I feel the same way. But have you had people say like, oh, I love Gen Q and like you sort of found out that they don't even know about the original? I mean, I think I think that people who like unlike us who really did not feel represented in that show just never really watched it. I mean, and the opposite is true, too. Sometimes I get like, you know, like my black non-binary friends being like, I am Alice or Bust, you know, I mean, like. But I do think that there were a lot of people who just like didn't really connect to the show. Or they, they were like, they literally, for like the people I'm speaking or they about literally weren't born. were not born. <laughs> they just like weren't old enough to have a Showtime subscription. I, I know. I mean, or they missed they I mean, missed the window of, you know. Yes. Yes. I think that's so that's so right. And I think that our show has fans. I think that like the original show has fans. I think some people hate it. Some people love it. Like, what are you the most proud of? And then like, is there anything that you would have like if you had the chance? Oh, I wish I would. I wish I would have just done this thing differently, whether it be a storyline or whatever. I wish that I had known how much how much to know about my characters and about the world before I ever wrote the pilot. Like like what? The way that I write now has changed fundamentally having written and ran this show for so long. Um, I just know how to break characters differently. And like, I know how to break story differently so that I have way more information up front um, instead of like, like there's a, I always feel like there's some things I know and then there's some things I'm like, I'm like, I'm not sure about until I'm like in it. Um, and I just think I needed way more information up front. Um, I think that would have prevented a lot of pain. Um, well, wait, give me a specific like, example. It's more like, like how I break character. So like, I, I always knew that characters needed, had, had to have wants. I always knew they had to have needs. So like the want is your conscious, is your conscious journey, your need is your unconscious journey. I, I always knew that because that's like fundamental to acting. Some things that I've like developed over time uh, are like things that they lack. And then, and th and a trait is something that never changes. So, so like those two pieces, I think um, some actors sort of come ready made with those things. Like writing for Rosie O'Donnell is such a privilege and a pleasure because she is, she is who she is, no doubt, in all spaces. And she's just a, a character, she just sort of brings a character that lacks a lot of things, you know? And, and so she's, you're, you're always rooting for her because she's like never quite doing it right, you know? And, and, and there's just that tension of like what they lack and what they want should be like riding like that. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there are some characters who I feel like have that on the show. Like I think Finley really has that. I think Bet really has that. I think Alice has that. 
And I do think Shane has that, though. I wish that Shane had it in different ways other than sexually. Like, I, I wish that there were other ways in which Shane's fundamental flaw sort of um, spilled out into just, like, other parts of her life. But there are some characters that I have that don't have, they don't have such clear, um, like, tr- like, a trait or a thing that makes them, like, unforgettable. Um, and I don't think I'll ever write another character without knowing that part of them. There's something different about like coming in with like, I'm the fuck up, you know, like Finley's the fuck up, like no doubt about it. Like she is like an archetype of a person, you know, and recognize and whether you like her or not, it's not really the question. It's just like, you know her, she's so knowable. Danny, same thing. That's an archetype of a character that you're like, "Mm -hmm, I know the girl who checks boxes like that. Marja Lewis Ryan, we did it. Thank you. We did it. Thank you. I'm <laughs> pumped that you're such a fan and I'm really grateful for your time. And I'm really grateful that like people are watching this show and I I am o- so open to criticism and I always just want to make sure that the, that the fundamentals of this show are being acknowledged that like, it's not just a show that I mean that that's really how I feel is that it's not just a show it really is a space for people to get good 